With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. In this verse, the Apostle Paul wants Timothy to know, and the Spirit of God wants us to know how to become mature students of the Bible. That is, to grow to the point that we are self-sustaining, self-feeders on the meat of the Word of God. A well-known adage says that if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, you can feed him for life. And the Apostle Paul knew an awful lot as a soul winner about fishing for men, but here he wishes to teach Timothy how to fish for the truth of God's Word, how to be a diligent disciple. So he says very simply, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Now, I want to rightly divide this verse and literally take it apart word by word, not only to help you memorize it and to place it in your mind, but to help you embrace it and place it in your heart, to help you apply it and place it in your hand and in your practice. That when your life comes to an end, the precious Lord Jesus Christ would say, I want you to know I approve of the life you've lived, I give my stamp of blessing and approval to the way that you handled and lived out my holy word. Now, as we just move word by word through this text today, I want to show you three principles about being diligent disciples. Number one, there is an instruction to follow. Be diligent. Now, most men don't like to follow instructions, but this is a word of instruction that men and women of all ages ought to take to heart. Be diligent. The King James translation renders this as the word study. Quite frankly, that's not a translation as much as it is a bit of a commentary and application because the word just speaks of applying ourselves to whatever the task at hand might be, to be Diligent. This is why the English Standard Version renders it as do your best. So what the Holy Ghost is telling us through the hand of the Apostle Paul is we should do our very best. We should apply ourselves. We should be zealous. We should be diligent to study the Word of God. Now, believe it or not, in these two little words, be diligent, I find that there are three principles about following this instruction of God. The first one is very, very practical. It involves a pending death. The book of 2 Timothy is the last letter that we have in the Word of God from the hand of the Apostle Paul. He would die not very long after writing this letter to young preacher Timothy. Paul knows his life is about to end, so with the, with the heart of a shepherd, with the love of of a pastor with the concern of a mentor. He dips his inspired pen in the ink of the Holy Spirit and writes this letter to Timothy because Paul knows his life is about to end. Now, there are many well-known verses in the book of 2 Timothy, and most of them, quite frankly, are after the verse that we're studying this morning and this month. But I remind you that the book of 2 Timothy was just one letter. It could be read basically inside about half an hour or less. Timothy, with with, with passion and love for his mentor, would have sat down and read this entire letter in one reading. And because of that, this young preacher, Timothy, is only about three minutes away from reading where Paul says that from a child you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate and truly equipped for every good work. As Timothy reads this letter, he's just a few minutes away from Paul saying, I charge you in the presence of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to preach 
the Word to be instant, in season and out of season, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And I imagine Timothy's reading that, that, that letter, and he, he's getting great encouragement, but as he continues to read, his eye falls on a little phrase that says that I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course I have kept the faith and there is therefore now laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day and not to me only but all those who love his appearing I can almost see Timothy as he reads that letter have you ever been guilty of skimming through a book a letter an email or even a lengthy text you get to the end and you discover that this This whole communication has been about something you didn't understand. And so now that that Timothy reads as the letter closes, Timothy, if you can come see me, I want to see you, but please try to come before winter. There is a pathos and a passion in Paul's writing. And Timothy now perhaps understands this is Paul's last letter. This is the final word of instruction. Can you see him as he feverishly goes back to the beginning of that letter and begins painstakingly reading it again Paul wants Timothy to know, Timothy, you're about to be on your own. You've got to be able to study the Word of God for yourself. These words would have been pregnant with emotion for Timothy because he was raised in a godly home by a grandmother who knew the Lord and a mama who walked with God. But most of what he knew about life and ministry, he learned Because he met the Apostle Paul on a missionary journey. Read about it in uh, the book of Acts chapter 16. Paul had poured his life into Timothy. He taught him how to be a soul winner, a missionary, a student of the Word of God. He had taught him how to be a pastor. Indeed, Paul most likely had installed Timothy as the pastor of the church at Ephesus. but, But very soon, Timothy would be on his own. There'd be no more counsel, no more letters. No more advice, no more sermons. For us in our technological age, there'd be no more text messages. There'd be no more FaceTiming. There'd be no more Skype. There'd be no more communication from or with the Apostle Paul. He's saying, Timothy, you're about to be in a place that you're going to have to learn to dig out the meat of the Word of God for yourself. This word of instruction is because of a pending death. Now, the reality is whoever it is that's teaching you the Word of God may or may not be facing an immediate pending death. All of us stare death in the face every single moment of every single day. But whether your Bible teacher, be it a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, your mom, or your dad, whether or not they are about to die, the truth is you are one moment away from being in a situation where you are going to have to stand by yourself on your own based on what you have been able to mine out of the Word of God. Maybe you'll be a college student heading back to the university campus. Perhaps it's just getting on the bus tomorrow with a bunch of classmates and fellow students who don't know God and who do not believe His Word. And you're going to be facing something, sir, in the workplace, ma'am, in the community. You're going to face some time where mama's faith won't help you and daddy's convictions won't help you. You're going to have to know and believe and embrace the Word of God for yourself. Paul, knowing that his own pending death is coming, he says, Timothy, you need to be diligent. That leads me to say to you today that you need to stay ready. When it comes to the Word of God, you need to stay ready so that when you need to be ready, you won't have to get ready. And that will only happen if you will embrace this instruction from the Word of God. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. This instruction involves a pending death. It also involves a personal duty. Be diligent. Even in our English language, we we understand this is what would be called an imperative. In the Greek, it's in the imperative mood. It just means there's 
there's a commandment here along with what we would call an implied subject. And the implied subject is you. Timothy, I'm writing this to you. And because the Spirit of God saw fit to include this letter in the canon of Scripture, the Holy Spirit is also writing this to you. And He's writing this to me. This thought is underscored when He says, Timothy, you need to be ready to make a presentation before God. And what is it that you're going to present? Are you going to present your church role? Are you going to present your resume? He says, no, you're going to present yourself. Be diligent to present yourself. I was recently telling one of my four children about their responsibility to study the Word of God for themselves. And the comment was made, well, Daddy, that's a little easier for you. You're a preacher. That's why you study the Word of God every day. Listen to me. I seek to study God's Word every day, not because I'm a preacher, because I'm a Christian. Do I fail in that? Do I have 365 power-soaked, spirit-saturated times in God's Word every year? No, but I'll tell you what. I want to be diligent to study and understand the Word of God. You say, well, preacher, I, if you're talking to me, I just don't understand all of the Word of God. Well, I know. That's why you study it. So you can understand it better. But secondly, I would encourage you, don't let the parts that you don't understand keep you from, from studying and applying the parts that you do understand. Now, mom and dad, I want you to imagine you're going to run some errands and you leave a to-do list for your teenage son or daughter. And on that to-do list, there are five things. Make your bed, clean your room, take out the trash, finish your math homework, and then there's a fifth one that's a little complicated. Now, when you get home, they say, well, I didn't understand that fifth one. That's why I didn't clean my room, take out the trash, make my bed, or finish my homework. I didn't understand all of it, so I didn't do any of it. That wouldn't fly at your house, and it's not going to fly with our Lord. There is a personal duty for us to study God's Word. Tonight at the 5 p.m. teachers meeting. I'm going to be meeting with all of our Sunday school teachers, and we're going to unveil a brand new Sunday school campaign simply entitled Back to Sunday School. We want to be busily gathering and growing to the glory of God. I'm talking about you taking personal responsibility that regardless of what anybody else does, this commandment, this instruction has been given to me to follow. As we study our records from the last quarter, did you know that in our church, I'm talking about post-pandemic, COVID-19, I'm talking about Delta variant, I'm talking about Omicron variant in that time frame, around 830 distinct individuals have attended one of our Sunday school classes. We're averaging about half that number. I want to ask you, would you take it upon yourself to be diligent? To present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be diligent. It speaks of a pending death, a personal duty. It also speaks of a passionate desire. The word here literally means speed. It speaks of a new priority, a new appetite. It speaks of making haste to do something. It is rightly rendered also as the word zeal, to be zealous, passionate, to be hungry to do something. A person who has no desire physically for food is either sick or dead. If you've ever had a loved one pass away, for example, they may have been under hospice care. One of the telltale signs that death is imminent, they stop eating. 
That's when the nurse comes to you, the doctor comes to you and says, if your brother's going to see your daddy before he dies, your brother better get here. Your mama hasn't eaten anything and going on the fourth day. Where there is no appetite, where there is no desire for intake, such a person physically is either sick, dying, or dead. And the truth is, spiritually, where there is no hunger and thirst for righteousness, such a person is at best sick, perhaps dying, and maybe spiritually dead. Do you have a hunger for the Word of God? Does it bother you? Does it trouble you when you miss time in God's Word? I'll tell you this, when it comes to physical food and physical hunger, nobody has to tell me when it's time to eat. I like to eat three times a day and between meals. You wouldn't know it from looking at me, but if the tapeworm ever dies, I'm in trouble. A passionate desire. As we begin to unfold our upcoming Sunday school campaign, there there may be some who'll say, I think it's kind of legalistic to focus on, you know, going to a Sunday school class. I grant you there's there's not one verse in the Bible that says thou shalt go to Sunday school. But I want to ask you, why would a child of God not want to? Why would you not? have a desire to eat of the meat of the Word of God. Somebody will say, well, you've just never been to my class. It's really not that good. Listen, if you get hungry enough, you'll eat the bark off a pine tree. If I got hungry enough, I know this is hard for you to imagine, but I might even eat an egg roll. If you don't know, your pastor doesn't like Chinese, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll scarf down some Chinese food if I got hungry enough to eat it. The problem usually is not that the meal isn't good, but that you don't have a hunger. Here's an instruction to follow. Be diligent. Why should we be diligent? Well, because this verse tells us about a second thing. There's an inspection to face. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Now, perhaps you heard about the college student who took a class called ornithology. That's the study of birds. And it came time for the final exam, and they had studied all kinds of birds all semester long. And he he studied the beaks, and he studied all of the, the genus and species names. He had studied their habitat and their diet and all of the particular intricacies about all of these birds. And when he got to the final exam, all it was was a picture of bird feet. And he had to name all of these birds based on their feet, on their claws. He hadn't studied that at all. And so in frustration, he wadded up his paper, slammed his desk against the wall, threw the paper at the professor and said, this is the dumbest test I've ever seen. And the professor said, son, you're not going to talk to me like that. What's your name? And he reached up, grabbed his pants leg, showed his legs. He said, you tell me. Well, brothers and sisters, the test that we're going to face, the inspection of our life we'll face in the presence of God will be no joke. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Three things I want to draw out of that phrase. First, there's a life to present. To present yourself. I guess if you had a test in your high school shop class, you would present the bread box you made at the table saw. If you had a presentation to make in an old home ex class, you might present the apron that you made at the sewing machine. If you had a test in band class, you might present the scales that you've been working on for your instrument. But what will be presented at this test? Paul says, be diligent to present yourself. Now, the Lord may look at a lot of different things to make that assessment. But He's actually going to be assessing you. 
If you've ever been in the military, for example, your drill instructor might come into the barracks and he or she might inspect the way you made your bed. They're looking at the bed. They're inspecting you. They're looking at your uniform. They're inspecting you. He or she may examine the way you polish your shoes, but they're inspecting you. Because all of that other stuff is just the evidence of how you are performing in the military. Well, in the army of God, there's going to be an inspection. And might I say, because we don't know when death is coming, and it is appointed unto man wants to die, and after that, the judgment, it's going to be a surprise inspection. We may be surprised about the when of it, but we ought not be surprised about the fact of it because the Bible says we need to be ready to present ourself approved to God. And some of the things the Lord may look at on that inspection day, He may look at our bank account. He may look at our giving record. He may look at our soul winning record, but all of it is in order for Him to examine you and to examine me. There's a life to present. There's also a Lord to please. I'm just walking my way through this first. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. I read recently about a young man called to ministry who went to seminary to train for the pastorate. And seminary, like a lot of other colleges or graduate schools, gives a lot of acronyms for the degrees. For example, somebody going into business might get an MBA, a Master's of Business Administration. Well, in seminary, you might get a degree called an MAR, a Master of Arts in Religion. The the Master's of Theology is called the THM, and a a, a Doctorate of Theology is is a THD. And so this young man heads off to seminary and somebody asked him, what what degree are you seeking? He said, I'm I'm seeking an A-T-G. An A-T-G? It's an Associates of Theology. What's an A-T-G? He said, approved to God. There's an old preacher line that says, you don't have to like my preaching. If mama's happy and Jesus is happy, I'm happy. The reality is, at the end of the day, it doesn't even matter if, if mama's happy. The ultimate aim is that, God, I want my life to be approved to you. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. And the word approved here is the Greek word doikimos. It's a big word that means to be tested tried and proven to be genuine. The Greeks would use that word to describe the making of coins, particularly with reference to the gold that was used or the silver that would be used in in the stamping out of those coins. James uses this word in the New Testament to describe what it means to be found faithful in the midst of trials and temptations, that that trouble in life, trials in life, temptations in life have put us to the test and we've come through the fire and we've been found approved. Often when we think about being found faithful in the midst of test and trouble, we think about things like sickness and divorce and financial problems and persecution and all of these things, but, but the Spirit of God uses the word here to describe you being found faithful in the test of your own personal Bible study. In this case, the test in which you need to be found faithful and approved may not be persecution. It may be laziness. It may be the test that happens when your alarm clock goes off 15, 20 minutes, however much earlier in the morning. You you made a commitment on a Sunday morning. I'm going to get up a little bit earlier. I want to spend some time in God's Word. And the next day when the alarm clock goes off and you're out of your routine, that's a test. And the Bible here says that you need to be found faithful in the midst of that test. 
When your Sunday school class convenes 15 minutes after the end of this service and you've got other responsibilities, other duties, and even other desires, that's going to be a test. And here the Bible says there is a Lord to please when it comes to studying the Word of God. Now, when gunmakers make a new weapon, they'll test it before they sell it. They'll test that design. They'll fire that gun. And if the gun barrel is able to withstand the pressure of firing that shot, the gun manufacturer will, will stamp the barrel of that gun with what is called a proof mark. That's the word that is used here. And Paul says, Timothy, life's going to put some pressure on you, son. And I want you to get into the Word of God And study the Word of God so that your life itself, the things you do, the things you say, the passions, the priorities, the goals, the aims, the objectives, so that all of that, when it's all been put through the test of this life, Jesus Christ can stamp your life approved to God. A life to present, a Lord to please Note also a labor to perform. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker. A worker. Now I want to be honest with you. If you're looking for something easy to do, don't set out to be a student of the Bible. God's Word is simple and clear, but Bible study is not easy. But if we do not do the work We will not pass the inspection. The Bible says we should be ready to present ourselves approved to God, not a slouch, not a son, but a servant, a worker, somebody who's done the hard work of studying their Bible. Now, I'm looking across the 9 o'clock service this morning. We're mostly home folk in this early bird service. And I know that you're familiar with the, 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 the passages in the Bible where Jesus will one day say, well done. And we all think, boy, on Judgment Day, I want to hear the Lord say, well done. But I want you to think about something and listen carefully before you start throwing tomatoes. Listen to the whole thing. There is no passage in the Bible where Jesus promises to merely say, well done. You won't find it in Matthew. You won't find it in Mark. You won't find it in Luke. Where Jesus talks about judgment day in those three gospels, he never says to anybody, well done. And he never promises he'll say to anybody else, well done. What he promises to say is well done, good and faithful servant. There's no promise of a well done that is not knit together, welded together with the idea that you've been a good and faithful servant. Not well done, good and faithful child. Not well done, Christian. Not well done, tither. But in each of those areas, well done, good and faithful servant. So when it comes to studying the Word of God, this idea of being a diligent disciple will take work. That's why Paul says be diligent about it. Put yourself to the test. Be willing, ready, and able to be a worker who's been approved to God. By the way, while we're talking and thinking about Sunday school this morning, have you ever thought about the fact that most of the work that is required for you to attend a Sunday school class has already been done? I mean, you're here this morning. You already got up. You already got dressed. Sir, you already put on your makeup. I mean, um, ma'am, you already put on your makeup. You got your, you got your hair done. You got, you, you got dressed. You got your wife here, your husband here. You got your kids here. You're already here. And the truth is, if, if people who come to worship, 
I'm going to say the same thing to the next crowd, and there's a whole bunch of them in the next crowd that are not in Sunday school right now, but they'll be in church next hour. The backsliders come to the next service. I'm teasing. Sort of. (laughs) But somebody who would put all the effort and work to come to the Lord's house for a 9 o'clock service, but not be willing to stay an extra hour for small group Bible study, it's not very likely that such a person is going to be willing to do the hard spade work of getting into the Word of God Monday through Saturday if you're not willing to walk down the hallway to meet with a group of like-minded believers to study God's Word. Why should we be diligent disciples? Well, because there's an instruction to follow. There's an inspection to face. Finally, there's an interpretation to find. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, we believe that the word of God is not only God's word, listen to this carefully, but it's God's words. Collectively, it's the word of God. Individually, these are the words of God. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says that every word of God is pure. In Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, plural, shall not pass away. And then in Mark 8, 38, whoever, Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You see, brothers and sisters, God did not merely send His commandments and His precepts with nebulous concepts. He gives us His instruction with individual words. And we believe those words have meaning. And under the leadership of the Lord, God the Holy Spirit, the meaning of those individual words can be derived and applied to our life. Now, with that in mind, let me mention three simple things. First, a prospect that is awful. There is implicit in this text the potential of an awful, devastating prospect. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Implicit in that is the possibility that you may stand in the presence of God ashamed. That I may stand in the presence of God with dreadful embarrassment. You know, one of the most common dreams that people have is the dream of being undressed at some level in public. In your dream, you're in the grocery store and you... (laughs) You pass by the mirror in the meat department, you find out that maybe, maybe you're either completely undressed or, of course, at Walmart, all you have to do is wear your pajamas. That's Walmart attire these days. But another very, un, a very common dream is, is to be is something that you're unprepared. Several times a year, I have a dream that I'm back in a college classroom and the professor is passing out a test. And I don't even know what class I'm in, let alone what's going to be on that test. And I wake up in this sweat, in this panic, because in that moment, I find myself unprepared. But all of that pales in comparison to the awful prospect that is implied here. The idea that we would be embarrassed in the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, that's not a dream. That's a nightmare. To be ashamed in the presence of Christ. Now, I do not submit that it's a nightmare that ought to keep us up at night, but that nightmare ought to get us up in the morning to be diligent, to present ourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A minister of mine growing up used to say that a good rule of thumb was 
don't do anything you wouldn't want to be doing when Jesus returns. That's good advice. Here's some other good advice. Don't not be doing something that you would want to be found doing when the Lord returns. And one of the things we need to be doing is to be diligent. To present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a prospect that is awful. There's secondly, a problem that is assumed. He says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if there's a right way, that means there's a wrong way. Watch this now. Apparently, the wrong way is the natural way. Apparently, the easy way is the wrong way. The default way is the wrong way because you've got to be diligent to not get it wrong. The wrong way is the way you're going to naturally do it if you and I do not seek out a proper interpretation of the Word of God. Now, this phrase, rightly dividing, is also rightly translated as accurately handling. The word of truth. It literally means to cut it straight. One of my favorite podcasts to listen to is the Cutting It Straight podcast with Pastor H.B. Charles from Jacksonville. But what I'm showing you is that if there's a right way, there's a wrong way. If there's a straight way, there's a crooked way. If there's an accurate way, there is an inaccurate way. And when I watch a lot of Christian television... I immediately recognize, I don't know what they've been doing all week, but they hadn't been diligent to study the Word of God. There's a prospect that is awful, a problem that is assumed. There's, in conclusion, a process that is accurate, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Now, by way of application, I just want to quickly give you three words, three ways that I think are an accurate process to study the Word of God. Now, this could be an entire weekend or week-long Bible conference, but I just want to quickly limit our discussion to three words. How should I study the Word of God? Well, first, study it properly. There's a lot that could be said about properly studying the Word of God in its context. There's there's grammatical issues, but I just want to be Bottom shelf practical this morning. The proper purpose of Bible study is not for information, but for transformation. So studying it properly is not with the ultimate desire to merely get it in the mind, but to get it in the heart and to live it out through our hands. You see, you can have more Bible degrees than a thermometer and not be right with God. You can wallpaper your bedroom with diplomas from Bible colleges and be educated beyond your obedience. The proper purpose of Bible study is to say, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? In the past, I've given you four questions that you should consider asking when you study the Bible. Is there a belief to change? Is there a command to obey? Is there a sin to avoid? Is there a promise to claim? We'll put these out through social media later, or you can just grab a picture of that screen. But essentially, every Bible passage, and therefore every Bible study, is calling you to believe something, to do something, to quit something, or to claim something. Lord, I want to study this text, derive its interpretation, so that I can live right, so that I can be approved by you. Study it properly. I also encourage you to study it privately. At some point, mature people are able to feed themselves. My wife went to see her dad this weekend. He's not feeling well. She went to make a visit. I'm 51 years old. My wife ought to be able to leave me with the four kids and assume that we're not going to starve to death. Because by now, I've learned to drive through the drive through at McDonald's. I've, I've learned to feed myself. You need to study it for yourself. You need to be like a group called the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. They studied after Paul's sermons. They didn't take his word for it. They wanted to know, is what he said the word of God? 
And may I share with you in what may sound a bit ironic, my goal as a pastor would be that if I ever fall into doctrinal error and start preaching and teaching something that's not the truth of God's Word, I would hope my ministry has been my own undoing because you are such students of the Word of God, you immediately recognize what the pastor is saying is not what God has said. You have a responsibility to me and to yourself to study the Word of God properly and private. But in conclusion, I urge you to study it publicly. Publicly. If you look back up the page in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, 2 Timothy 2, 2, and the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He says, Timothy, I taught you some stuff, and I want you to get some men around you, and you teach them what I taught you, and then you, dis- then you uh, commission them and send them out to teach others. We're, we're going to do that in about 15 or 16 minutes. We're, we're going to spread ourselves out where some godly men and women have been taught and they've learned the Word of God and they want to teach what they've learned from the Word of God to others. One of my favorite stories to tell is of a wealthy vineyard owner who had two lazy boys. These young men had been raised in the lap of luxury with the silver spoon in their mouth. And if you know anything about second-generation wealth, it usually doesn't last very long. And this old vineyard keeper was a wise man. On his deathbed, he told his two boys that he had buried their inheritance out in the vineyard. So when their daddy died, they got out there on hand and knee, tiny little spades digging around all the roots of all those vines, looking for the treasure that their daddy had left them. They never found a box of gold. But that year, they had a bumper harvest of grapes. They realized then the daddy tricked them when he said, the wealth that I've left you is buried in the vineyard. And Brothers and sisters, our God has left us the wisdom that comes from the fear of the Lord. It's buried in this book. You and I have to dig it out. You say, Pastor, how would I do that? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.